What's your earliest memories with the with the horses? My earliest memories, uh, I was a, a freshman in high school, going to Christopher Columbus High School in the north end of Boston. So I was uh, 13 years of age, and my brother Greg, who's six and a half years older than I am, started riding races at uh, Suffolk Downs in East Boston. And when I got out of school at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'd jump on the train, go three stops, and uh, watch them ride the last few races. But I had to sneak in, because back then you had to be 18 years of age to get into the track, unless you had an escort, you know, a, a chaperone, an adult. So I'd climb the fence, sneak in, and watch them ride the last three, four races, and, and then head home and have dinner and do my homework. And uh, fast forward to the summer of 1971, between my junior and senior year in high school, Greg got me a job walking horses for his mentor, Odie Clellan. And that gentleman eventually taught me how to ride. So, uh, yeah, I got fond memories of, of my my beginnings in, in horse racing. And you know, right? What like what was so special about the horsemen back in the '70s? Their horsemanship. Yeah. You know, they they were they were really true horsemanship. They were horsemen. They uh, they were hands on. They, they didn't rely on, on, on veterinarians. Uh, they, they knew how to uh, fix problems with horses. They knew how to correct situations. And uh, I feel very blessed that I sort of uh, grew up and was nurtured in that type of environment. That uh, I learned a great deal of horsemanship from the guy who taught me how to ride, Mr. Odie Clellan. And uh, it, was, it was just different back then. And you know, in your lifetime, right, who goes down as the, um, the best trainer for you? I would probably say the best trainer that I had the pleasure of riding for was uh, Charlie Whittingham. Yeah. Yeah, he, they called him the bald eagle. That Maybe they'll call me the bald, mm -hmm. the bald sparrow yeah, yeah. <laughs> today. But, um, yeah, Charlie was amazing. Yeah, and you know, out of all the wins as a jockey, right, which, which, which one for you is like your favorite? The Kentucky Derby, yeah. without question. Now that's not my greatest achievement. Yeah. Winning the Derby is is really a question of being in the right place at, at the right time. A lot of times that's the case. Uh, for instance, when I got the mount on Go for Gin, it was only two weeks before the Derby that year. Uh, funny story. I'm sitting in the jocks room two weeks before the Derby at Santa Anita, and the phone in the jocks room was very close to my locker. It rang like 12 times. I'm getting ready for the races to begin. So I went over and picked up the phone. I said, hey, hello, Jock's Room, Santa Anita. How can I help you? The guy says, this is Nick Zito. I'm looking for Chris McCarron. I said, hey, Nick, how you doing? I said, don't tell me you need a rider for Go For Gin. He yeah. said, yeah, I sure do. Bailey, Bailey spun me. <laughs> so he said, I, I need a rider to... Uh, he said, but I, what I need you to do is... Uh, next Saturday, which is a week before the Derby, I want you to fly to Louisville, and you want, I want you to breeze this colt over the, over the track at Churchill. So I did. I took the red eye out of L.A. on Friday night. I was on that colt's back at 9 o'clock that morning, and when I, got, when I got back to the barn, I went right into Nick's office, and I called my wife. And I said, look, Judy, I know you're not crazy about going to the Derby anymore because it's crazy. It's bedlam, you know. I said, but you're coming this year. She goes, why? I said... I've never had a horse get across the track at Churchill like this one did. You know, he, his breeze was amazing. And um, he just gave me goosebumps the way he worked. And uh, fortunately, you know, the next week he, he ran the way he worked over the track, which was fantastic. When you had the jockey school, right? I know you had a lot of jockeys come through there. Who, who was a natural right from the door that, that, said, that said something to your spirit right, right from the gate? The Davis, the Davis kids. Um, Jackie first. Jackie was in my very first group of students. Um, she showed a tremendous amount of courage. She was fearless, completely fearless. She is still is today. And then a couple years later, Dylan came down and joined my program. And I knew within a week, as far as Dylan goes, I knew within a week that he had something. I wasn't too sure yet if it was the it factor but uh, he looked just like a natural on a horse, you know? And I'm so proud of him, that what he's accomplished, 
leading rider at Aqueduct, almost knocked Irad off the pedestal at Belmont, had a great meet there. Uh, he, and he's a, he's a very, very good race rider, and more importantly, he's a really good human being. He takes after his mom and dad. All right, Saratoga, right, what makes this place so special? Number one is the history, you know, they opened here in 1863. Uh, the, the horses that have, have competed over this track, uh, you can't top that list of horses. Not even the Derby or, you know, any, any of the other big events. Nothing takes the place of Saratoga as far as a race meet goes. It's, it's the number one. I've only got two regrets of things I did not do when I was riding. One was to ride Royal Ascot. I wish I had done that. Um, and the other one was to ride Saratoga. I rode here a bunch, but I never rode here for a full meet. Yeah. And uh, I, I wish I had taken, taken that on. Uh, reasons I didn't is because when you, when you leave your own circuit for a month or two, it's really hard to get your live mounts back once you go back. So I was riding at Del Mar every summer that ran concurrently with, well, still does, concurrently with Saratoga. And, uh, but I was here, I never spent any time in, in the town of Saratoga. I would fly in on the red eye and fly right back after the races out to the west coast. But I was here in October of 2002. I had already retired from riding and we, we were here for a week shooting the film Seabiscuit. And I just fell in love with the town. You know, it's the first time I'd really spent any time here. It was just so beautiful and uh, everything that, this place just reeks of class. No matter where you go in the town, it's, it's classy, you know. It's a, it's a very special place. How important is the men and women that wake up every day and work with these animals? Any person who has any connection, physical connection with a horse, number one physical connection, that would be hot walkers, exercise riders, foremen, assistant trainers, trainers, crucially important. Without them, you know, it, it just can't be done. And then you bring the owners into the mix who put up all the money, they make the whole thing go with one exception, the fans. The fans, the public who attend the, the races on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly, annual, whatever, the fans are really what makes this whole thing work because without their participation, you know, we wouldn't have the purses to run for. But uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of a t lots of different people, lots of different positions that are very important to, to make this racing thing work. And you know, do you take it all in that being so legendary of a figure in racing? I count my blessings every morning when I wake up, I say my prayers, I thank God for all, all that he has bestowed upon me, and I pray again at night before I go to bed. And uh, my, the number one thing I, I'm, I'm thankful for is uh, my health, my family, of course my friends, and, uh, and also thankful that God blessed me with an ability to communicate with thoroughbred racehorses. And you know, besides yourself, right, who goes down as the best jockey in your lifetime? My hero is Lafitte. Yeah, I, I can't separate Lafitte and, and Bill Shoemaker, but uh, you know everything that Lafitte had to do to accomplish what he has accomplished is, is mind-boggling. The guy subsisted on 750 calories a day. He was very devoted to his physical fitness, to his health, and he was also dedicated and devoted to his occupation. This guy would ride anything with hair on it. I would shy away from horses that I thought weren't my cup of tea, but Lafitte would, would ride anything that you, that you put him on and ride him. He would ride a $6,000 claimer the way, same way he'd ride a, a grade one stake, you know, and uh, he's, he's truly my hero, my idol.